What's up, everybody? This is DDP here with our first official, uh, first official AEW video. Now we've done a couple others in the past, but considering for the moment the rest of the sports world is on hiatus, there's not a whole lot of sporting-related events for me to talk about right now. One thing that is still going is professional wrestling. Although WrestleMania is in serious jeopardy, we still have AEW for the time being. Now, worth noting, they were supposed to be in, I think, Rochester, New York this coming Wednesday, and they've now relocated. They haven't canceled the event, but they are relocating from Rochester to, I think, St. Petersburg in Florida. They're just trying to get out of what is a hotbed area for coronavirus to a more, at least, neutral or not yet, in, uh, you know, hotbed, like I said. So with that in mind, for the time being, we're going to start talking pretty frequently here some AEW wrestling content. I will sprinkle in some WWE, but I will warn you guys, I have about had it with WWE right now. For the time being, I'm at my wits end with that company, so don't be surprised if you see more AEW instead of WWE in terms of video by video. So, breaking down into Dynamite last night, we had a pretty solid show overall. Now, I'm not going to give you the play-by-play -play of match-by-match -match and things like that. I'll leave that to guys like Wrestling With Regret. But I will say this much. This was a pretty solid edition of Dynamite. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a go-home show. It wasn't something that blew you away and just had you at a fever pitch for the upcoming pay-per-view. But it did satisfy a lot, and it continued a lot of storylines. The matches were pretty solid quality, very few botches. There were a couple, nothing that was distractingly bad or something you know, scary like a guy getting dropped on his head. But again, I think a pretty effective show, all things considered. Now, we opened up with a match between Cody Rhodes and I forget if it was Santana or Ortiz, but it was one of the, uh, one of the members of the Inner Circle. With them at ringside, you had the other tag team partner from the Inner Circle, Again, either Santana or Ortiz. I forget exactly which one he faced in this case. And then in Cody Rhodes' corner, you had Brandy, his wife, and their Nightmare Family coach, which is just a fancy way of basically saying his modern-day manager, Arn Anderson, at ringside as well. Now, very early on in this match, you have an appearance then in the crowd from Jake the Snake Roberts, who made his AEW debut last week and basically called out Cody Rhodes and pretty much said, He's going, he has a client, and he's going at Cody. Now, the guy's name escapes me. He's not a guy that's been, he's been around in the wrestling world for a little while, but he's not a guy that's been in WWE, NXT. Uh, I don't think he's even been in TNA slash Impact Wrestling and just got into AEW, but I'll do some research on him, again, in the ramp up to getting really invested in all this stuff instead of the semi-casual fandom I've been going with for AEW in recent weeks. I'm going to have to start picking up some of these guys as well. Um, so, with that in mind, they come out. They're just a distraction for Cody. The match is okay. It's nothing to write home about. In the end, Cody wins with a figure four leg lock. And you have a beatdown then that ensues uh, on Cody Rhodes by the two tag team partners from the inner circle. And then you cut to basically Jericho on the big screen. He's talking about basically the upcoming, it's basically War Games. I know we can't call it War Games because it's AEW, but the War Games match was made by Dusty Rhodes. That's Cody Rhodes' late father. WWE has the rights to the match, but apparently the match type is still being used. Two rings, one cage, two teams of five. It's basically Survivor Series in a cage with two rings. Interesting concept, but an original Dusty Rhodes concept all the same. And they're calling it Blood and Guts, not the greatest roll-off-the-tongue match. Uh, I think that would be a better name for just the event, like the show, to call the match that is not that great, I think. I'm also a little concerned how quickly they're rolling out another major event so close on the heels of Revolution. Revolution had a really good uh, build, weeks-long build. It wasn't like WWE trying to throw a new pay-per-view out there every month. It was like a six- to eight-week build and it felt really, really strong. In fact, it might have been longer than that. Um, it was a really solid build between their pay-per-views. Yeah, it was much longer than that because you had Cody versus Jericho at one pay-per-view they had. And then the next time around, you had Jericho versus Moxley. So, yes, very solid build in that regard. Very old-school wrestling. Allow the storyline to develop. And I think... As a result of that, you had four or five matches by the time Revolution rolled around, which, by the way, Revolution is what AEW is going to try and push as, like, their WrestleMania, their big 
crescendo storyline every year. But in the build-up towards that, you had like four or five matches at a fever pitch where you really couldn't do anything else prior or other than the match blow-off match itself. And so they did that well. I'm concerned now that like three weeks after that, we're like, here's blood and guts. Like, uh, it's, it's a little fast. But regardless, I think it'll be a good match. You have a lot of very talented guys here. I've got in the picture behind me, Adam Hangman or Hangman Adam Page. I always want to say the nickname in the middle because that's more typical wrestling. But Hangman Adam Page of the elite, loosely associated of the elite. You have Cody Rhodes, you have the Young Bucks, and you have Kenny Omega. Great. This is legitimately phenomenal storytelling they've been doing with the tension between Hangman Page and the rest of the elite. This has been going on really all the way back since October when Hangman initially challenged Jericho for the, at the time, it was the right to be the first ever AEW World Champion. It was Jericho versus Hangman Page. Jericho wins, and Hangman goes on a bit of a downward spiral for a while there. He builds back up just a little bit, but he keeps seeing all the shine the rest of the elite get instead of him, how he's kind of treated as like an outsider in that regard. He's kind of the fifth man, the odd man out in that group. And so it leads to all this telling. Now, I don't go and watch all the Being the Elite YouTube channel stuff that they do to further that story, but it is still a very good progressive thing they've done where there's real tension now between Matt Jackson of the Young Bucks and Hangman Page specifically. You've had tension with Kenny Omega and Hangman Page as well, but now they are the tag team champions. And even though they've had their struggles, they've largely come through it. The The match, the tag team championship match at Revolution between Kenny Omega, Hangman Page, and the Young Bucks was phenomenal. Probably one of the two or three best tag team matches I've ever seen. I will get into that in a later time, but just know... I think this dude here, Hangman Page, he might have been, as the Young Bucks put it, uh, to build tension within the group. He might have been a bit of a jobber in Ring of Honor. This dude has the makings of a star. Like, legitimately one of the best young stars I think AEW has right now. And he is crazy over with the fans. So they should really keep that in mind as they continue to build him up. But you have this whole beat down in Sue. He doesn't come out during the fight between the elite and uh, the inner circle, but you do cut to Jericho on the big screen. He's taken out the other young buck, the younger of the young bucks there. And that was Nick Jackson. And as a result of that, you basically have like, okay, for most of the night, you're not going to have most of the elite there. Cody was gone, both young bucks and Hangman had a match that night, a tag team match, not a championship match. Cause Kenny Omega is out with a broken hand right now, but he had a tag team match against Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara, and as a result of that, he had a mystery partner he had to figure out. They teased that it might be one of the Young Bucks, but he quickly squashes that. It ends up, we find out later, being Dustin Rhodes basically stepping in, the natural Dustin Rhodes, Cody's brother, and in that case, that's the main event. We'll get to that. I know I'm a little scatterbrained right now, but this is this was a pretty solid continuation of the storyline there. They keep teasing this tension and you can see that the elite is not on the same page whereas the inner circle could not be more on the same page and they look more dangerous than they've looked yet in AEW they took out the champion John Moxley last week power bombing him off the stage through a table Moxley wasn't able to compete in storyline this week he was out with an injury basically medical suspension and this week they tease doing the same thing to hangman page after beating up the rest of the the elite that was there, that's Cody Rhodes, that's uh, Matt Jackson. He came back and actually made the save, saving Hangman from getting powerbombed off of the stage as well, just like Moxley the week before. And while he makes that great stand, they continue their tension where it's kind of like, I'm saving you, but just know we're still not cool. And then they promptly both got laid out by the inner circle. So funny how that works out. You have the elite plus Dustin Rhodes all laid out. Again, one of the members of the elite not there, that being Nick Jackson, who in kayfabe was taken to the hospital as a result of the assault earlier in the night from the inner circle. That is probably the best thing going right now because that's what's going to sell the blood and guts match. Otherwise, on the card, you have solid competition from... I still like uh, what you're seeing from Jurassic Express. I like 
the chemistry that they have with that. Luchasaurus, for his size, he's like, what, 6'8", 6'9", 275? The dude is just a freak of nature athlete. And he's over in a huge way. This this whole crowd, and I believe it was Salt Lake City, was top-notch. Like, legitimately very good. Very into the whole night. Um, invested throughout. I never felt like there was really a dull moment. E- you know, even in some of the cases, AEW has been criticized for its women's division. And that that's a valid criticism, I think. I do think they have some stars there for sure. But I think that's just more of a work in progress for them. And, man... She's she's more of a heel character, obviously, but B Priestley, I think, is very much going to be a big star for them in the women's division. I think she has the makings of that as well. They're really trying to put over Dr. Britt Baker. I I just don't care. I don't see it. Whether they had her wrestling constantly or whether they turned her heel and then started having her shoot on everybody, including the commentators, the whole role model gimmick, it just doesn't really move the needle for me much. But we'll see. They've got a lot of great athletes. They just have to storyline-wise build them up and give them something to do. So, uh, with that in mind, there's there's not a whole lot otherwise that jumps out at me. You had the was it the the basically the death triangle with Pack and um, yeah this this is the Lucha Bros. This is a really intriguing tri- trio that they've put together. I'm curious if AEW, because of how many of these small faction groups they seem to be building, I'm really curious if they're going to try and introduce basically a, this is back way back in the day, more of a territorial kind of thing. I think NWA had it as well, but basically a six-man tag team championship belt where you have, instead of tag teams of two, tag teams of three and have a division like that. That would be really unique and it would give other parts of the division, other parts of the roster, I should say, something more to do but then you run the chance of the risk i should say of kind of watering down the value of any championship belts they need something else because right now for the men's division they got the tag titles and they got the aew championship they need that that undercard that mid card belt right for the wwe that's always been the intercontinental championship or the united states championship they need one of those i don't know what they're going to make they've talked about that they are working on something but it's unclear as of now what that belt will be. Uh, the women's division, like I said, they got to work on that. But right now they have just the one belt with Nyla Rose having that championship. And uh, that's a whole can of worms um, for some people. I just go on what's in the ring, what's happening in the ring. That's my focus. And for right now, it's a good champion for others to chase after. It's a good belt and a storyline in that regard for them to be chasing after. So... I'm very, uh, very encouraged by what I see from AEW. I really have been eager the past couple of weeks to see how they continue their momentum from the fallout of Revolution, which was, which was I think, a fantastic pay-per-view. Not every match was a winner, but they, they were largely very good in what they had uh, in that card. Jericho versus Moxley was great, beautifully done. Jericho's entrance was a thing of beauty. You had... Um, Cody Rhodes versus MJF, that was a very good match as well. He was involved in that Jurassic Express match tonight. And yeah, I think that there's a lot of young talent AEW has. People sometimes want to compare them to WCW. I'll wrap this up real quick. They sometimes want to compare AEW to WCW. But I think one thing AEW understands, it has to build the young guard. It cannot just say... Hey, Moxley, you used to be Dean Ambrose. Come in here, and I know he's the champion right now. But Jericho, former WWE guy. Moxley, former WWE guy. They're not just taking the old guard or the current guard and just propping them up. It feels like they are legitimately trying to build a lot of the youth on this roster, a lot of the young stars who can be something. MJF is 23 years old. They have pushed him over big, including that win over Cody Rhodes at Revolution. And it's perfect for his heel persona, how he got over. I think it was a good finish, all things considered. They talked about this throughout the match. Both guys, Luchasaurus, I don't know his actual age. They jokingly say because he's supposed to be like a dinosaur, that he's 65 million and one years old. Uh, Haha. But the other guys in Jurassic Express are like 22 and 23, respectively. B Priestley, I think they said, is 23. I had no idea she was that young. I thought she was probably mid to late 20s at least. But they have a lot of great youth on 
the roster, they just need to build these guys up. You know, Cody's 35. Matt Jackson is 35. They just have to build up the entire roster so that within the span of three or four years, they don't find themselves saying, dude, how do we make new stars? How do we continue this momentum? Because that was the issue with WCW. Once they started taking in all the WWF talent in the mid-90s, they had that run from 95 where they were struggling to the introduction of the NWO angle with Hogan, Hall, and Nash. That launched them into the top of the ratings war, but by late 1999, they really squandered it, right? 84 weeks was that span. They really squandered that momentum by not building anyone else up, right? It was all the old guard. The closest thing to a new star they had, I mean, he was a star for them, was Goldberg. And once they stopped really pushing him to the moon, the wheels fell off. It was nothing but old guard, and you had a hard time getting guys over. Jeff Jarrett was the best thing they could put over at that regard. That's not good enough. I think AEW understands that, and I think they're trying to build everyone up evenly and as well as we can. So... Well, uh, this was just kind of a free-form first video for AEW. I know it's not my most structured one. I think what I'm going to start doing moving forward is I'm going to start basically keeping notes, kind of like I've done in Maverick reviews, uh, Maverick game, post-game shows at times. I'm going to take some notes throughout, and basically, I, I don't want to start grading or scoring matches. I think what I'll do is I'll grade like a show as a whole, basically on like a five-star system or something like that. And we'll just go from there. That's all I. That's the best way I know to do, without you know skipping over too much. Because I know in this review I only talked about a few specific highlights and then kind of context around everything else. But stay tuned. We'll figure it out. We'll get going. But look for a lot more AEW content moving forward while the rest of the sports world basically sits at a standstill. Until next time, guys. That's my time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video. Leave a comment below. Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, re. Remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.